It is now my pleasure to welcome Peter Stern of Troy Resources. Thank you so much, Peter. Thanks, Amy, and hello, ladies and gents. Great to be here. Um, first slide and the second slide then is the disclaimer, please. Um, and the third slide is a snapshot. So Troy owns the Karuni project, gold project in Guyana, South America. And we acquired this through the acquisition of Azimuth Resources in 2013. And through the acquisition, acquisition we picked up two modest size resources, Smarts and Hicks, and they were interpreted to have ore of an average grade of four gram per tonne gold. And the plan was to start producing from these mines with a view to applying all that surplus cash we were gonna to make towards the area's significant exploration potential. And we borrowed US 75 million and we developed Smarts and Hicks and built the Karuni mill. And you can see there from the table, um, oh, the table shows gold production revenue and AISC for the last three years. And you can see in 2018, when everything goes right, we produce a lot of gold and make a lot of money. So not so good in 2019. And then 2020, a really poor outcome for reasons I'll discuss shortly. So we're currently forecasting for the current year production of between 35 to 40,000 ounces at an AISC of approximately US 1500 per ounce. And in the next table, you can see that in mid year, we had all reserves of 77,000 ounces. So taken together, our production forecast and our reserves, Troy shares are anything but a buy at the present time. However, we do in fact have really um, significant brightness of future. So we have a million ounces in resources and outstanding exploration potential. But the real excitement in the short term lies in our Smarts Underground prospect. And I'll talk more about that shortly. So a couple of weeks ago, with the assistance of Canaccord and Azure Capital, we undertook a placement, we raised 12 million at 12 cents per share, uh, some new institutions and high net wealths. And we've got an additional 3 million to come subject to shareholder approval at the AGM. So given where we've been, this was a really, really good result. And in the top right hand column of that page, you can see our cash position was 13.2 million right after the raise, which is the strongest position we've been in for a long time. And at a share price of 12 cents, we have a market cap of approximately $88 million. And in M&G and Rafa, we have two highly supportive institutional UK shareholders that represent an aggregate 24% of the share register. Um, our MD is Ken Nielsen, outstanding, outstanding, highly experienced mining engineer, and two NEDs, Richard Beasley and John Jones. Now, John has done an outstanding job for the company over many years, uh, but you would have seen in a release to the ASX in October, he announced that he will retire, excuse me, retire at the AGM in a couple of weeks time. So why Guyana? Why were we attracted to the place? Well, it's English speaking, English law, Modern Mining Act. And after the election earlier this year, the country's returned to a much higher level of political stability not, not that it was instable um, pre-election, but it, it's certainly better post-election. Well, that might sound familiar to you all. Um, and it's a good place for an Aussie company to be doing business. And so why is Guyana a good place to search for gold? Well, um, Greenstone's an excellent host rock for large gold deposits the world over. And there's a substantial Greenstone belt that runs through the West African Shield and into the Northern part of South America including Guyana. And you can see here from this map, some very substantial deposits, 48, 32, 23 million ounces to name a few. And in 2019, Barrick CEO, Mark Bristow, described the Guyana Shield as a significantly underexplored region and one of the most prospective in the world for large scale gold discoveries. So what do we have? Well, this map, it's of a scale of approximately 30 Ks by 20 Ks. And our ground position is identified, not particularly well, but by um, um, gray, gray outline, shapes in gray outline, leases in gray outline. And you can see our Karuni mill located right next to Smarts and Hicks. And then a whole bunch of other named prospects, essentially all of them within 10 or so Ks of the Karuni mill. And some of these prospects have resources mapped already in the case of Ohio Creek, Spearpoint, Goldstar. 
but still much exploration work to do on each of these to get them to their fullest potential. And then we've got various other prospects, which are highly prospective, such as Upper Itaki, top, uh, top left-hand corner, Kaburi Hills, bottom right-hand corner. Um, now, Kaburi is right next to the Omai deposit, not owned by Troy, but has a resource of 5 million ounces. And neither Upper Itaki, nor Kaburi Hills, nor a whole bunch of these other things have been the subject of previous drilling. And I'll talk more about our exploration potential, and in particular, Upper Itaki shortly. So this next slide shows a couple of photos up the top, Akaruni Mill, million tonnes per annum, nominal capacity, standard CIL and gravity circuit, and then our SMARTS 3 pit below. So understanding how we got to where we are is best achieved by looking at a share price chart, and I'll take you through it. And you can see that in early 2016, when production commenced, share price took off. And then by mid-2016, we recognised we had a bit of a problem, being that the average, grades of smart, average grade of smarts and hicks was not the four gram per tonne we'd believed, but instead much closer to two and a half grams per tonne. So having just borrowed US 75 million, that was a really bad situation. And so the share price went down. And then in December 2016, we had a significant pit wall failure at SMARTS 3, our highest grade pit, and the share price tumbled again. And then in the face of a debt spiral, half the board bailed out, leaving Ken, John, and later myself to rescue the company. So it was a really, really tough situation. And then late last year, just after we'd completed a large cutback at SMARTS 3 to access some additional ore, we had to abandon the pit due to pit wall stability issues. And around about the same time, we tragically had a fatality on site at a location nowhere near Smart 3 pit, I might add. But in consequence, and for no substantive reason, um, we were shut down for two months by an overzealous politician. And so basically, you can see there, our share price has remained in a pretty tight trading range of eight to 12 cents for the whole of this period. And one of the reasons for that is we, and that's one of the reasons why we kept a pretty low profile whilst we sorted through the mess. And so the fact that we're now out and about and talking at the Noosa Mining Conference should be a strong signal that we believe we now have something of interest to investors. But having said that, we did have a really good period operationally during 2018 shown by the red arrow. In fact, we had nine months of continuous production of plus per gram per tonne ore from SMARTS 3. So we got our AISE down to as low as US 700 per ounce. And that provided significant free cash flow. In fact, around about US $20 million. And all of that went to debt retirement. And I just raise this to demonstrate that when we do get really good access to plus three gram per tonne ore, we make a hell of a lot of money. And of course, back then the gold price was 1400 an ounce US. And today it's a whole lot higher. So something to bear in mind when I discuss the future shortly. And so pleasingly, that's the bad part out of the way. And I can now talk about the good part and that's Smarts Underground. And so we've known about Smarts Underground for some time. We've been mapping 3 million tonnes at 3.3 grams per tonne for approximately 300,000 ounces of gold. And bear in mind, if that resource converts well to reserve, that's potentially four to five years of production at current levels and from an ore source that is of good grade and located only a K or so from the mill. So earlier this year, when the gold price increased, we set out to complete the nine remaining infill holes. And for each of the seven holes for which we've re received assays so far, each and every one of them has been pretty spectacular. And I'll show them to you when we flip to the next slide. And so today we have all the information we need to both upgrade the resource and determine a maiden ore reserve at Smarts Underground. And we expect, to, we expect to announce that during the December quarter or perhaps early in the March quarter. We'll have to see how it goes. So the deposit is currently mapped over a strike length of approximately 350 metres into a depth of around about the same amount, but it's still open at depth and also a long strike to the northwest where we've previously in, um, intersected good mineralisation. So anyway, we're expecting feasibility work to be completed in the March quarter and all approvals, not that there are many, um, but all approvals in a sort of around the same time frame. And we expect mine development to commence in, commence in the June quarter and hopefully first production by around mid next year. 
So early figures are showing a pretty modest development cost to first ore. Uh, and that's because the first pot of ore, 30,000 ounces, representing sales revenue of approximately US 55 million is only 600 meters or so from the mine opening. So, um, so happy days. So um, this next slide illustrates the, the best intersections I talked about just a moment ago. Uh, now, I won't go through them in detail. I'll just draw your attention to the red ones because they're the best, one, best ones. <clears throat> and in particular in hole 189, we have this intersection of 11 meters at 130 grams per tonne. So truly world-class intersections. And this next slide illustrates a, a long section of the Smarts Underground. And you can see the ore body all looks pretty tight and robust. And this next slide illustrates a conceptual underground development. Um, you can see the portal in the Smarts 3 pit, cheaper solution than commencing a decline from surface, quite obviously. And you can see a grey highlighted pot of ore containing the 30,000 ounces of gold just near the mine opening, as I mentioned. So um, as I said earlier, the Karuni project not acquired for Smarts and Hicks, but rather to explore the highly prospective exploration potential. Um, but as I mentioned earlier as well, since production commenced, essentially any of that free cash flow has been applied towards repaying our loan, not on exploration. And that means this outstanding ground position has barely been tested. And here's a couple of photos. So on the left is an aerial shot of a stream identifying our Gold Star and Gem Creek deposits. And you can see this river or stream right through it. And what is noticeable that every one of the many rivers and streams through the area has been shredded like this one by the old timers looking for artisanal gold. And they've done that simply because there's a hell of a lot, lot of gold there. And, this, and I'll refer you to the, the slide on the right now, Upper Itaki. So some years ago, the Guyanese government undertook, undertook a countrywide stream sediment survey and the very highest gold values in the whole country came from the Upper Itaki region. And the artisanal workings in the area are just as extensive. And yet we've only just recently commenced reconnaissance work there and we haven't drilled a single hole yet. But with the funds we've recently raised, this is all going to change soon. So Upper Itaki is just one of the, the many highly attractive prospects that we're going to now be able to drill with these additional funds. And, and I guess there's a, there's a really important point here, and that is since all of, all of the infrastructure, the mill, the roads, camp, et cetera, are in place, we're pretty highly leveraged to any new discovery. So this next slide looks at current exploration and related activities. Uh, don't intend to go through it in detail. Clearly lots of work going on at the moment and mul at multiple prospects. So lots of news, hopefully good news to come in the near term. And this next slide summarizes the current corporate activity in Guyana. Um, now, it certainly wasn't always this busy. In fact, when we entered Guyana, there was very little interest from major corporates. But for now, it's good to see Barrick pretty active in the region. And then earlier this year, some real excitement. Um, Gold, Guiana Goldfields, which is the largest gold mining company in Guyana, was the subject of a takeover bid from TSX listed Grand Columbia, which bid was then trumped by a higher offer from the TSX, TSX listed, the Chinese backed Silver Corp. And that was in turn trumped by a cash offer from the Chinese company Zijin. So clearly there's considerable interest in establishing a presence in Guyana at the current time. And now that Guyana Goldfields is off the market, we are the biggest and arguably best available corporate opportunity. So you never know, maybe Troy can be a, a beneficiary of the renewed corporate interest at some stage in the future for the benefit of all shareholders. So I'll just sum up on this slide. So since we entered into Guyana in 2013, um, we're in our best ever financial position um, for the first time, we can allocate a decent um, exploration spend, um, bearing in mind, firstly, the attraction of crude when we bought it was the exploration potential. And secondly, just how leveraged we are to exploration success. Um, assuming smarts underground proves up as we expect, um, we're likely for the very first time to have a longish life deposit of good grade, adjacent to the mill, and this 
will bring pleasingly an end to the hand to mouth existence we've endured up to now, which has been really painful as you can imagine. So the country, um, arguably the most political stable Guyana has been since we've been there. And the level of corporate activity in the country is at its highest level since we've been there. And you all know about the gold price. It's, this is the highest prevailing gold price since we've been there. So, you know, all things considered, we'd like to think that Troy's time to, time to shine 